Good morning. Again, it's good to see everybody here this morning. You're visiting with us. We appreciate you coming to be to be with us today to worship God with us. We began a series of lessons on what is the truth about. We looked at what is the truth about God. We looked at what is the truth about Satan. Last week we looked at what is the truth about heaven. Today we want to look at what is the truth about hell. And again, before we get started, I need to give a credit. And I'll read this because I am using one of her pictures. The artwork by Pat Marvinko Smith, copyright 1992, from a series entitled Revelation Illustrated has been used by her permission. It is available in fine art prints and visual teaching materials. Again, this was about 10 years ago when I bought this. So if this is still true, I don't know. But call 1-800-327-7330 for a free brochure or go to www.revelationillustrated.com. When you hear the word hell, what do you think? What do you think? A lot of people think of what the cartoons depict hell to be. You know, if you can't read that right there, it says, all right, who turned this thermostat down? Well, people think that hell is a place that the devil is in control. He puts you where you think you deserve to be. You have to work in that fiery abode. I know Yosemite Sam went to hell because he did something bad, but according to the comic, he got out. Sometimes you slide in or you slide out. The cartoons and many television programs and movies make hell appear to be a comical place. We also hear that hell is a place where bad people go. And we have in our own minds who we think the bad people are. But God's Word tells us that there is no comedy in hell. Hell is a place that we need to avoid at all costs. God has tried to warn us in His Bible through His Word about this place called hell. But it seems we don't really realize how horrible hell will be. And people are headed straight into the bowels of hell and can seem completely unconcerned about it. So what is the truth about hell? First question we want to ask, is hell real? I believe we saw in the statistics last week that over 50%, I can't remember if it's 53 or 58, of the adults in the United States do not believe there is a hell. But as we look in the Bible, the Greek word that is translated hell is Gehenna. It is found 12 times in the New Testament. Jesus uses it 11 times. James uses it once. And I'm going to give you just a I think three illustrations of where Jesus used it. In Matthew 5.22, Jesus said, But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Rekha, or thou worthless one, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. That's the word Gehenna. In Matthew 10.28, Jesus said, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Then in Matthew chapter 23, verse 33, Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? So right there, Jesus says, yes, hell is real. In James, we find in James chapter 3, verse 6, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. So then the Bible then plainly declares to us that hell is real. It's not a myth. It is not imaginary. We might ask the next question though. Why does hell exist? When we looked last week, or excuse me, a couple of weeks ago at the, uh, you know, what's the truth about Satan, we saw in Genesis chapter 1 verse 31 that everything that God created was good. And then Satan became evil. Well, what about hell then? Why is there a hell? In Matthew chapter 25 verse 41, 
tells us there that hell was made for the devil and his angels. It reads, Then shall they say also to them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. The word prepared there according to Thayer means to make ready or prepare. So God made hell for the devil and his angels. But unfortunately, most people will be there as well and we'll see the verse concerning that momentarily. God, though, wants all people to be saved. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning His promises. Some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So God does not want anyone to be cast into that place that was made for the devil and his angels. Again, hell was not prepared for mankind, but the majority of mankind will be there. Matthew seven thirteen and 14. Those verses read, Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. So we see that those angels and the devil who sinned will be there, but also most of mankind will be there as well. So hell is a place for an unprepared people. I put prepared up there. That's not the word. Heaven is a place for a prepared people. Hell is a place for an unprepared people. So we know it's real. We know why it exists. What is it like? What is hell like? Again, Matthew twenty-five forty-one. Hell is a place of eternal fire. Eternal means it always exists. Then shall he say also to them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. The word everlasting there comes from a Greek word according to Thayer means without end, never to cease, everlasting. It is not a place where people go, stay a little while, and they are annihilated. Or it would not be everlasting punishment. Luke 3.17 says there, Whose fan is in his hand, and this is talking about Christ the judge, who will thoroughly purge his floor and will gather the wheat into his garner, but the chaff will he burnt with fire unquenchable. Unquenchable there, according to Strong's means, not extinguished. That is, by implication, perpetual. So the fire never goes out. You know, in Luke chapter 16, we, we find the rich man. The rich man's not in hell. He's in torments in Hades. And we see Lazarus in the part of Hades that is called Abraham's bosom or paradise. You might recall from our study last week, the Hadean realm is the realm of unseen spirits. It's not heaven. It's not hell. But it's where we go when we die. It is the basically the holding place for the dead until the judgment day comes. At the judgment day, then will we, we will receive our final reward or punishment. And then heaven and hell will be our eternal abode. Again, Revelation chapter 20, verses 12 through 15. There it says, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death, and the King James translators translated Hades as hell here, but this is actually the Greek word Hades, which is Hades. It says, And death and Hades delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. <coughs> Excuse me. And death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is hell. So there, Hades and hell are not the same thing. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Again, the rich man is not in hell. He's in torments, but he gives us some insight into his abode there in the Hadean realm. Luke 16, verse 26. 
And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. So he is in flame. He's in torments there in the Hadean realm. But hell is much worse than that. Hell is a place of eternal fire that we've already seen, but that's not all. Hell is a place of outer darkness, a place of weeping, and a place of the gnashing of teeth. In Matthew chapter 8 and verse 12, Jesus there says, But the children of the kingdom shall be cast into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. In Matthew chapter 22 verse 13, then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 25, 30 that we looked at this morning in Bible class. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You'll notice that Jesus said in the first verse that we read there that the children of the kingdom... He's talking about Christians that are unfaithful. There are Christians who will be found in outer darkness. I know I've used the example before, but I figure most of us have probably been in a cave at one time or another. And when you get down in there and they turn the lights out, what can you see? You can't see anything. Think of outer darkness as being that way. And then forever trapped in total darkness and engulfed in eternal flame. Again, there are those, I've had one man especially tell me that whenever he knows, he knows he's going to hell when he dies, but he's going to be shaking hands with friends so long he won't even know he's there. No, he won't. He will never see a friend. He will never see anything else. When Jesus says, depart from me, ye that work iniquity, and that's Matthew 7.23, that's the last time the wicked will see anything that is good, upright, or lovely. And hell being a place of outer darkness, it is the last time the wicked will see anything except in their mind's eye. In their mind's eye, they're going to see their lost opportunities. In their mind's eye, they're going to see themselves enjoying the pleasures of sin for a season here upon this earth instead of being obedient to the will of God. In their mind's eye, they're going to see themselves once faithful and then falling away. In their mind's eye, they're going to see their loved ones following them down the very same path of destruction that they followed. And knowing that they helped to lead them into that place. Their father, their mother, their son, their daughter, their brother, their sister, their spouse, their best friends. And they help lead them down into that place of punishment. In their mind's eye, the resurrected body, and that's what we're going to have whether we're in heaven or we're in hell, it's going to be outer darkness outside. But in the mind's eye, things will be very, very clear. Now let's look at the weeping part. Outer darkness, yes, but weeping as well. Weeping and wailing that come from the tortured mouths of those who would give anything for just one more chance. Just one more opportunity. You realize that the rich man there in Hades didn't ask Abraham for another chance. He knew he didn't have another opportunity. But he wanted him to send Lazarus back to his brothers so they didn't come. What did Abraham tell him? They have Moses and the prophets. If they won't listen to them, they wouldn't listen to someone that came back from the dead. You know what? Jesus Christ came back from the dead and most people are not listening to Him today. Weeping and wailing from pain and agony. Just one more chance. Hebrews 9.27 says though, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this to judgment. See, you have the opportunity of a lifetime. Don't mess it up. There are no second chances. Then there's the gnashing of teeth. The gnashing of teeth. Why do people gnash their teeth? They gnash them in pain. Shows their extreme anguish. The utter despair 
that they will be under. Notice I'm saying they. We don't want to be there. There's a never-ending gnashing of teeth that only stops during periods of weeping and wailing. Hell is a place where the worm does not die. In Mark chapter 9, verses 43 through 48, Jesus there said, If thy right hand defend me, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Verse 45, And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. For it is better for thee to enter halt in the life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, where the fire is not quenched. And if thine eye offend thee, enter in, <coughs> excuse me, it is better for thee, or excuse me, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. You know, Jesus is using hyperbole. But think about it. How attached are you to your hand? How attached are you to your foot? How attached are you to your eyes? Are these things that are very important to you? They are, aren't they? They're important to us. Our feet, our hands, our eyes are important to us. So we'll see what he's talking about in a minute. First, let's go look and see what's that phrase, where the worm dieth not mean. It's translated from the Greek word skaleps. And according to Moulton's lexicon, it means a maggot. Or metaphorically, a gnawing anguish. You know, there's no worms in hell. But there will be gnawing anguish. Robertson's word picture says, the worm, for example, that preys upon the inhabitants of this dread realm, according to Gould, two bold figures of Gehenna combine the gnawing worm and the burning flame. No figures of Gehenna can equal the dread reality which is here described. And a matter of fact, this goes back to Isaiah 66.24 where it says, They shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. For their worms shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched. And they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. So you think about it. There is going to be an eternal gnawing anguish that comes from knowing the things that we saw in our mind's eye a while ago. The missed opportunities, the opportunities we had to obey God's will, we refuse to do that. The eternal anguish that comes from knowing there is no hope in ever leaving hell. There's no way out. So what is Jesus talking about? When He talks about our hand, our foot, and our eye, cut them off, pluck them out. He's saying if there is anything that is near and dear to you, Anything that is extremely important to you and it's trying to lead you astray, get it or him or her out of your life. They are important. So our hands, our eyes, and our feet. If they're leading us astray, get them out. Because you don't want to be in hell. Hell is a place to be avoided at all cost. Revelation 14, 9 through 11 is one of the most comprehensive pictures, pictures of hell that God has given us. It says, The third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, of course, this is talking about an emperor worship back then. Today it would be talking about anyone who is not faithful to God. Verse 10, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. You realize today no one is facing the pure wrath of God. On that day in hell, that is the pure wrath of God. 
It continues to say, And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. If it was not an everlasting punishment, the smoke would not be everlasting. Verse 11, continuing. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. On the judgment day, the sinner will be forced into a face-to-face -face situation between himself and God. 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. We're going to meet God face to face in judgment. Romans 14, 11 and 12, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Alright, so so far we've seen hell is real. It was made for the devil and his angels. Most people are going to be there. Who are they? We need to know who is going to be in hell so we're not in that group. Well, all whose names are not found written in the Lamb's book of life will be in hell. Revelation 20, 15. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. There are a lot of verses that we could go to this morning to see what the works of the flesh are, the sins, and such, such things as that. Since we've spent a lot of time in the book of Revelation, let's go to Revelation 21.8. There it says, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with, with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. We need to know who they are, don't we? We need to know who they are. First of all, it mentions the fearful. Strong says that means dread, timid, by implication, faithless. The fearful are those who lack the courage to make a stand for the Word of God. They don't contend with the world. They don't fight the flesh. And they don't resist the devil. That's who the fearful are. They deny Christ while facing persecution. They don't want to have to put up with it. Think about this. How often are we afraid to denounce sin because the sinner is influential? A spouse, a child, a friend, a parent. Maybe we don't want to hurt their feelings. Maybe we don't want to make them mad at us. We might be afraid we'll run them off. You ever heard that? Oh, I can't talk to them. I might run them off. How do you think they'll feel when they're enduring the horrors of hell? You think they'll wish you'd have said something to them? Mark 8, 38, Jesus said, Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. You know, there's a little song in the song book. Well, not in ours. It's not in this one. One of them is called, You Never Mentioned Him to Me. Uh, what is it? Went in the fair land uh, beyond the strand. Anyway, we're standing there and someone comes to us and says, You never mentioned Him to me and you met me every day. You know, we're going to... We, our obligation to God is to stand bold for the Word of the Lord, follow His commands, love the sinner enough to try to save the soul. Whether we make them mad or not. You think about right now. We all know someone who's passed on and gone to the grave. We probably all know several. Did we do anything to help show them the way of salvation? Do we hope to see them in heaven? Or do we know that all hope for them is gone? Think of those that we still have a chance to influence now today. They still have a chance for eternal life. They may not have much time left on this earth. We don't know, do we? We never know. And that's whether they be young or old. You know, right, uh, our grandson down in Texas had another brain bleed. He's back in the hospital. Hopefully he's out now. 
But the doctor said he's sitting on a time bomb. It may go off, it may not. We don't know when we're going to die. We have no idea. Are we going to do something to help those who are lost now? Now's the only time we have. It also mentions the unbelieving will be in hell. The unbelieving, they deny the truth. They resist all evidence of God. They resist the evidence of Christ, the Bible, and the church. You know, atheists are in that group, such things as that. The Israelites who came up out of Egypt could not take the land of Canaan because of their unbelief. It obstructed their way. Hebrews 3, 17 and 19 says, But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but unto them that believed not? So we see they could not enter in because of unbelief. If we have unbelief, we're not entering into heaven. Hebrews 11.6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Another group that will be in hell, the abominable. That includes those who are polluted with unnatural lust, guilty of nameless vice. You know, Proverbs 15.9 just says, The way of the wicked is an abomination unto the Lord. But he that loveth him followeth after righteousness. The word way there, according to Strong's, means a road is trodden. Figuratively, a course of life or a mode of action. So in other words, the course of life of the wicked is abomination to God. And then who are the wicked there? Strong says that's the morally wrong. A bad person. But that's a bad person according to God. Not according to our definition so many times. So abomination, it means disgusting, abhorrence, idolatry. We saw in Proverbs chapter 6 last week some of the things that are abomination and also Leviticus as well. Murderers are going to be in hell. You realize how lightly human life is taken? Not just today, but since the very beginning of time. People were killed for their shoes and such things as that. Those who perform the torture and execution of unborn children are going to have an eternity to think about what they did in this life. Of course, we know that as abortion. But that's not all. Murderers includes another group. 1 John 3.15 Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Whoremongers will be in hell. That's also another word for fornicators. The word fornicator there, and this is Strong's definition, a man who prostitutes his body to another's lust for hire, a male prostitute, a man who indulges in unlawful sexual intercourse, a fornicator. That includes adulterers, fornicators, whores, prostitutes, rakes of every description, according to Clark. Sorcerers will be in hell. Strong says that word for sorcery there means a drug that is a spell-giving potion. A druggist, no, we're not talking about the guy that runs the pharmacy down here. You know, don't, don't confuse this. A poisoner, a magician. And again, this is not just the guy that has car trips. This is someone who practices witchcraft and such. The word sorcerer is a generic term that includes all who attempt to indulge in divination, someone who puts spells on others, etc. Devil worship would be included in that as well. Idolaters will be in hell. I can't imagine kissing or I guess that's what she's doing, the foot of a stone or wood image. Those who worship the creature instead of the creator and ascribe things and persons and properties and honors that belong to God alone and gives them to something else. Anything is an idol that takes the place of God in our affections. The miser makes money as God. 
Sometimes parents make children their God because they put children ahead of God and vice versa as well. There are a lot of other things we place in our lives where God should be. Colossians 3, five says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and I use this because it says, and covetousness, which is idolatry. We're putting things ahead of God. And then all liars are going to be in the lake of fire as well. I'm going to give you a list, and I know I've done this before, of the different ways that people lie. You're going to see the verses here. If you have your sheet, you'll see the verses there as well. A misstatement of facts. In other words, saying something we know is not true is a lie. You see the verses. Twisting words. In other words, making a person say something he did not say. One thing I can tell from that verse, there won't be any politicians in heaven. Twisting the truth. A clever wording to make a lie out of a fact. Half-truth. Part of the truth disguises the whole truth. You know, like Abraham said, Sarah was his sister. Well, that's half right. She was his wife too. Exaggerating. Enlarging something beyond the bounds of truth. You know, that, uh, that bluegill I caught. Crafty questions. Creating doubt and unwarranted suspicion like saying, are you still beating your wife? Slandering. Uttering false charges to damage someone's reputation. Insinuation. In other words, make a statement which leave untrue impressions. Silence. Withholding information to hide the truth. That's a lie. Flattery. Insincere and excessive praise from the motive of self-interest. Quotation. Making another person do your line for you. Oh, you know what that is. If Leland calls, tell him I'm not home. No, that's just quotation. White lies. Now, I love the definition of that one. A lie a hypocrite has tried to whitewash. Adding to God's Word. Don't do it lest they'll be found a liar. Proverbs 30, verse 6. A person that says he has not sinned is a liar. 1 John 1, 8 to 10. One that claims to know God and does not obey Him is a liar. 1 John 2, 4. One that says he loves God and hates his brother. 1 John 4, 20. That's a lie. You know, mankind tries to make hell a place we can laugh at. You know, think it's humorous. But God, the one that made hell, tells quite a different story, doesn't He? Hell is real. It is a place of outer darkness where wailing and gnashing of teeth are always present by its inhabitants who are engulfed in eternal flame. There is an everlasting gnawing anguish that will envelop those who are there because of their missed opportunities and failure to obey God. The vast majority of those who have ever lived on this earth will be eternally in hell. That's the truth about hell. Brother Wendell, or hell is, again is to be avoided at all costs. Brother Wendell Winkler wrote this, and I quote, Hell is a place where men always die yet never die. Never live but always live. Hell is a place where men live forever. But there's no hope for which to live. That is utter hopelessness. You know, between the two lessons, the one last week's a whole lot easier to give than the one this week. Because we want to be in heaven. But God warned us more about hell than He said He would reward us heaven. It is a place to be avoided. You know, this morning, if you are not a child of God, in other words, you have, you've heard the Word of God, Romans ten seventeen. You believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Jesus said, if you don't, you'll die in your sins. John eight twenty four. If you believe not that I am He, you shall die in your sins. 
We are told that we must repent of our sins, Acts 17.30. Confess Christ's deity, again, Matthew 10.32 and 33. Be immersed in water for the remission of our sins, Acts 22.16. That's how we become a child of God. That's when our sins are washed away. But this morning, if you are a child of God, are you being faithful? If you're not being faithful, it's time to come back to God today. Now, while you still have the opportunity, if you have any need, come now. Make your need known as we stand and sing.